Love the chatter here. <laughs> Seems you guys like each other or something. It's kind of nice. Welcome to worship. It's Good Shepherd Sunday. It's one of the rich images we have in the season of Easter. Easter, Jesus as the Good Shepherd of the sheep. We have a leader and a protector who lays down his life for us who, even more than that, gives us his life energy that we might live like him. Imagine it, living like Jesus. Are you ready for that? Uh, We gather in that promise. I invite you, as you are able, to stand for our worship. I guess before we begin, I should thank Bill and um, Kate for the flowers. that adorn our worship space. Um, we have no one signed up for coffee, um, but I know that even though no one signed up, often if you go into that room after worship, coffee magically appears. So I invite you to do that and stay for a little conversation. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, by whose hand we are given new birth, by whose speaking we are given new life. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of the new creation. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Praise to you for the life-giving water of baptism, the outpouring of the spirit of a new creation. Satisfy the world's need through this living water, where drought dries the earth, bring refreshment. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Spirit reigns forever. Amen.
The grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Lord Christ, good shepherd of the sheep, you seek the lost and guide us into your fold. Feed us and we shall be satisfied. Heal us and we shall be made whole. Make us one with you, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from Acts, the fourth chapter. It helps to know that Peter and John had been arrested the previous day because they were proclaiming the news of the resurrection of the people. The next day, the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, <clears throat> by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, 
whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Word of God, word of life. And we will share Psalm 23 together, reading responsively. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. <clears throat> Good shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> Our second reading is from the first book of John, third chapter. We know love by this, that Jesus Christ has laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit that he has given us. Word of God, word of life. Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. <coughs> I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. 
just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Price one pays for spring, right? There's an old Christian meme that serves as a bit of a wake-up call for folks like you and me, or at least me, who sometimes get a little complacent about our faith and lose our edge when it comes to loving our neighbors. The meme goes like this. You've probably heard this, I'm guessing. If being a Christian was against the law, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Have you heard that? Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's a clever question. It's a question that kind of stops us in our tracks, compels us to do a little soul searching, a little stock taking, to take a good, hard look at ourselves, at how we're living our lives, and and challenges us to take our faith more seriously, to walk the talk, as they say, or as our second reading from 1 John has it, to love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. So what do you think? How do you think you'd fare? Is there enough evidence to convict? In your case, what does your life reveal? Want to take a little test? (laughs) A little pop quiz? Who doesn't love a pop quiz? Have you played the role of the Good Samaritan and been a good neighbor in your life? Have you befriended those who are counted last, least, and left out? Do you lift up the poor and defend the weak? Have you forgiven those who have hurt you or offended you? Have you turned the other cheek? Do you love your enemies? Do you pray for your enemies? It's a rather daunting to-do list don't you think? I'm not sure I feel up to this level of scrutiny. How about you? But the question of evidence to prove our faith need not condemn us. The quality of our dedication and devotion to the way of Jesus can be a consoling friend and not just a prosecuting attorney. That's what the author of our second lesson in 1 John taught the members of his church. And it's the good news of the gospel for us this morning. The question of our behavior need not always point to a lack of evidence. It may also point to strong evidence that should serve to comfort and console us, Um, that should reassure our hearts, that our relationship with God is sound, that it's strong and sure whenever our hearts condemn us. 
Now this may seem and sound like a dangerous place for us to go, to look to our behavior for comfort and assurance. And this is especially so for us Lutherans and any Protestant Christian who've had it drummed into our heads that we are to put our trust in Christ alone. If you want to know where you stand before God, you look to Jesus. You look to the cross. You don't look to yourself. Martin Luther went to great pains to, te to teach the church, to teach the church just that. To teach that we are justified by faith apart from works of the law. Luther taught this as a matter of, of necessity, the true foundation of our faith the article upon which the church stands or falls. Life for us is founded upon God's goodness, not our own, not our own. You ask the question, are you going to heaven? You don't go to heaven because, God, because you are good. You go to heaven because God is good. That's what the gospel teaches us. Luther also taught us to regard our own good works as filthy rags compared to the all-sufficient work of Christ. So we get this. We know all this as good Lutherans, right? What's less known to many of us is Luther's teaching that there are works that we perform that are God-pleasing. God-pleasing. For Luther, any deed that arises that is inspired by true faith, no matter how small, is a God-pleasing thing. Jesus, too, spoke, on this, spoke in this vein on occasion. You may recall these tender and encouraging words from our Lord that he spoke to his disciples. Truly, I tell you, Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who belong to my father, none of these will lose their reward. So there is a sense in which you and I can look to ourselves and to our own behavior for comfort and for reassurance, for confidence that we are on board with God that we are with the program, that we are doing what God wants done because we are in right relationship with God. So another pop quiz. Have you done good to people in your life? If only in fits and starts. Have you tried to love people who are difficult for you to love? even if it has proved a struggle to do so. One step forward, two steps back. Have you given money to someone who needs it? Maybe just a little, a couple bucks. Have you followed in the way of Christ like this, but faltered again and again and again? If you and I can answer yes to any of these questions, it says something very important and very hopeful about us. It says that God's love abides in us, abides in you, that you and God are not strangers, but friends, that God lives in your heart. It says that you are from the truth, the deepest truth in life. It says that your life has begun to reflect the image that you bear, the image that you were born to bear as a child of God, that you have become a mirror image of Jesus, laying down your life for others, just as the good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep, for us. 
God is greater than our hearts. The author of 1 John tells us. The author is speaking here first and foremost of God's great and unfailing love in Jesus, which overcomes all our failures, all our weakness, all our stumbling, all our faltering in love once and for all time.